Good evening, Ajahn Jayasaru and the members of the Mahasangha. My name is Brother Uni. Uh, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, welcome to BGF. And uh, I understand that among the audience are also people from Thailand. Uh, so allow me to say somebody. I think it's right. <laughs> um, just a brief introduction of uh, Ajahn uh, before we start. Um, Ajahn born in the Isles of Wight, England, in 1958, and he was then called Sean Shiverton. He has done a lot of traveling, and uh, one of the places he went to was in India, where then he acquired the interest in the Eastern religion, and of course meditation as well. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> in 1978, he visited the home state Vihara, and from there on he uh, became an Anagarika, uh, spending Vasa with Ajahn Sumedho. And later on he proceeded to Thailand and received the Upasampada from the late Ajahn Chah in 1980. And uh, Ajahn is, was the former abbot of Wat Pa Nan Achat until the year 2002. So currently uh, Ajahn is the abbot of the Hermitage in Korat, where the Sea Games is now being held. <coughs> and this evening, uh, Ajahn shall share with us on the topic of suffering and karma, core of Buddhism. And with that, we'd like to invite Ajahn to commence the talk. Thank you. Now, throughout the, the Buddhist world, all the different traditions, uh, I think it's generally acknowledged that the, the core teaching is that of the Four Noble Truths. And so, um, when we speak about suffering or dukkha, uh, we always have to remember that it is the first of the Four Noble Truths, of course, and in the West where the misinterpretations of, of Buddhism have some, sometimes outnumbered the interpretations of it, um, the emphasis on dukkha or suffering as being the distinctive uh, Buddhist teaching um, led many commentators to um, portray Buddhism as a very pessimistic teaching, indeed a nihilistic one. And even in the Encyclopedia Britannica and many um, very well-known, reputable works of reference, um, Nibbana uh, would be um, <clears throat> explained as being an absolute extinction so you can imagine that uh, this didn't endear many people to the Theravada Buddhist teachings. The, the word suffering itself is uh, more or less a, a compromise translation. Translators, students of Pali have been shaking their heads for years about how to translate this word dukkha into English and finally decided on, on suffering as probably the, the least bad of all the possibilities or the one that gives least suffering to the translators. Um, I, I myself uh, prefer to use the, the, the Pali, Pali word and uh, dukkha and the reason for this is that, that the word suffering, as is often um, commented upon, uh, leads to a rather narrow and distorted um, understanding of what the Buddha is talking about. Um, so I, I would like to um, give my interpretation in a nutshell of what this word means and my 
definition is not Nibbana. Uh, so Dukkha means not Nibbana. Now, sometimes you read um, books on Buddhism and they say in Buddhism it teaches everything is Dukkha. Mm. Well, if you did think about that statement just for a moment, you'll see that it's a meaningless statement. It doesn't mean anything. If you say everything is dukkha, well, it's like saying everything is up or everything is. Um, it's not saying anything at all. Um, that statement would only have meaning when there's something which is not dukkha. And what is not dukkha is nibbana. And it's because uh, the, the statement everything is dukkha you know, is not strictly speaking correct that uh, we're all here to, uh, together tonight and that because there is a path out of dukkha. So my second um, suggestion for this term dukkha is a lack of true happiness. So uh, if we put those two together, um, we can say that Nibbana is true happiness. And, and there is um, a teaching of the Buddha where he puts it in those very words. He says, uh, Nibbana Paramang Sukhang, which means Nibbana is the supreme happiness. Now, I think when when we look at it this way, at least for me, it makes um, certain teachings a lot clearer. Sometimes we'll hear Buddhists saying, oh, he or she, she thinks they're happy, but they're not really happy. You know? Or um, even happiness is suffering. You know, we, that's often said, isn't it? Yeah, they, they say they're happy, but really they're suffering. They're not really happy. Um, and, so, of course, the person who's experiencing that emotions says, well, I, I, what's the difference between, um, between being mistaken about being happy and being really happy? You know, isn't it good enough? You know, and as Buddhists, do we have a, um, an answer to that kind of question? So if we take dukkha to be meaning an absence or a, a lack of true happiness, next question is, well, is there such a thing as true happiness? And this is the third noble truth of Naroda. Yes, there is. Um, and is, there, is it possible? Is it realizable uh, for ordinary human beings like all of us? to realize that true happiness of Nibbana and the Buddha says yes. So, so why, how is it possible? And it's because that lack, that absence of true happiness, of Nibbana, is conditioned. It's not a curse. It's not something we've inherited through the um, mistaken actions of human beings thousands of years ago. It's not um, in the stars. Um, it's due to our lack of understanding of the way things are. So the, I am, of course, talking around the Four Noble Truths here. So reformulating the Four Noble Truths, uh, our experience of life is, is one characterized by a lack of of a true enduring happiness and that lack of true enduring happiness is due to a lack um, or an absence of understanding which manifests as craving. That, that situation is not inevitable, it's not fixed, it's not um, something we have to um, try to come to terms with and to accept, but it is something 
um, that we can transcend, we can realize this true happiness through the Eightfold Path. Now, we can see that the, the Buddha started off with the human condition. He started off with the way things are. He started off with those um, aspects of the way things are which are immediately recognizable. He didn't start off with a very advanced and, and complex metaphysical system and then um, asked his followers to try to fit their experience into it. He didn't tell you how you should be um, because the Buddha realized if you have a teaching um, consisting of instructions about what kind of person you should be um, that the end result is that most people end up feeling guilty um, that they're not how they should be. So the Buddha starting off with how you are right now and why is it like this? Does it have to be like this? If it doesn't, what are you going to do about it? So it's a very practical teaching. So it's as if the Buddha uh, recognizes um, an expanse of water um, and he points to this shore and he says there's a shore over there and to get from this shore to that shore you build a bridge. So he recognized the, the water to be crossed and then he built a bridge rather than building a bridge and then uh, finding some water to put under it. Uh, it's a topical example perhaps. Um, <clears throat> and the um, the, the faith that we need as Buddhists is somewhat different from the faith uh, that is expected of followers of theistic religions. And, and I think it's important that we are able to distinguish Buddhism from other teachings um, without um, saying we're right, they're wrong, we're better, they're worse. But in order to um, <clears throat> be very clear about why it is exactly that we're happy to be Buddhists and we, are, uh, we consider this the, the path which is most um, fruitful and beneficial for us. And uh, I, I've often um, divided the religions of the world into two main families, the family that grew up in the Middle East um, and those, the religions that belong to that family we can characterize as belief systems. Um, belief, faith is the central virtue in those systems and indeed their religions are often referred to as faiths these days. Um, this faith and that faith. So the word faith and the word religion, um, at least in the English language, have almost become interchangeable. And this is why Buddhism is often misunderstood and uh, is often seen to be somewhat confusing um, because it is not a belief system. You know, the, the first, I think, really central point that we need to uh, acknowledge is that Buddhism is a different kind of religion. It's a different family. Uh, it's a different species of religion. And it's not religion as belief system, but it's religion as education system. Mm. So you say, is, some people say, is Buddhism a religion or is it a way of life or is it a philosophy or is it this or is it that or is it a, a philosophically religious way of life or is it a um, religious um, philosophy or, and um, people spend hours and days and months um, going on. So we can talk about, yes, it's a religion, but it's a different kind of religion. It's, a, it's an education system. And in this education um, system, faith has a certain role to play. Um, but it is always mediated by wisdom. 
So wherever you come across the word sata in the, in the Buddhist teachings, you'll notice it's always part of a group of dhammas or virtues. And if faith or sata is the first one, then wisdom will always be the last one. And we're constantly reminded to balance the two. So faith um, in Buddhism has to be um, overlooked, mediated, uh, tempered by the critical faculty. And the Pali word that we chant, ehi pasiko, um, come and see, uh, means that we we're open to challenge. You know, if you don't um, believe in this, it's fine. And you can put these teachings to the test, and you should do that. So, faith has the role to play um, of clarifying our um, objectives and our path and, and leading to effort or wiriya. Um, and faith um, in the Buddha's enlightenment is in essence faith in the enlightenment of a very special human being 2,500 years ago. But the implication of that faith, and that's faith in something that we have no means of proving, is the faith in the capacity of a human, a human being to realize enlightenment or to transcend dukkha and to realize the true happiness of Nibbana. So we're looking into the, the the meaning, the implications of the fundamental movement of faith in Buddhism. Faith in Buddha's enlightenment means faith in the human capacity for enlightenment. And the next step and the crucial step following from that is we have strong faith and confidence in our own capacity for enlightenment, every single one of us. So if somebody says, what do Buddhists believe in? You know, has anyone ever asked you that? What do Buddhists believe in? You say, uh, well, we believe in our capacity to abandon the unwholesome. We believe in our capacity to develop the wholesome. We believe in our capacity to purify our minds. We, in other words, um, have a strong faith in our capacity to transcend dukkha and to realize Nibbana. Now, even if uh, in this lifetime um, we, we don't realize uh, that aim, we um, take it as the duty, the responsibility, the, the motivation, the orientation uh, of life which gives meaning to every, every day, every hour, every minute, every breath that we have. is that movement um, towards Nibbana. Now, once we have the ultimate goal clearly in our sights, that is transcendence of dukkha, realization of nibbana, which means ultimate true happiness, which in turn means the complete absence of greed, hatred and delusion, then we can now start talking about the middle way. Yeah, so what's the middle way? The middle way is the optimum practice. In any given situation, whether we're in a, in a monastery, in a dhamma center, when we're at home in the office, uh, sitting in the car, um, that way of conducting ourselves through body, speech and mind, which is most effective in reducing the defilements of greed, hatred and delusion and promoting the positive qualities of generosity um, and uh, compassion and wisdom. Um, that is the middle way for us at that moment, um, at that time. So dukkha in the Four Noble Truths, 
dukkha as an arya satya, as a noble truth, um, can be transcended, should be transcended, should be transcended by me, must be transcended by me. This is the, the kind of progression that one follows in one's contemplation. Yeah. So this is not um, a philosophy. We're not just accumulating um, sophisticated and inspiring ideas, but it's about our lives right now. Um, and we can see very clearly, I think, in the, in the present day, that high ideals and um, belief in noble things is not enough. Every single day, people are doing terrible things to other human beings um, in the name of very high ideals. So it's not what you believe, it's what you do. It's what you do with your mind, it's what you do with your body, it's what you do with your speech. In other words, it's your kamma. So kamma is action. Action of body, speech and mind. And it's the action which is characterized by intention. Intentional action is the heart of kamma. <clears throat> so action of body, speech and mind inspired by defilements of greed, hatred and delusion we call very simply bad kamma. And actions of body, speech and mind characterized by intentions um, of generosity, um, kindness and compassion, wisdom, are good karma. And so in our lives, um, the challenge moment by moment is how can we create as little bad karma as possible and create uh, as much good karma as possible. So we can resolve all these in in incredibly um, uh, complex teachings into, into some very, very, very simple challenges in, in our life. And I would ask you, don't be afraid of simplicity. Don't feel that the more complex an argument is, uh, the better it is for you, um, or the more beneficial um, it necessarily is. Sometimes we can pick up Dhamma books and we think, wow, this is really profound. And say, why is it profound? Because I can't understand a word of it. Um, and then we see something like, um, uh, don't, don't uh, create bad karma, do good karma. Oh, that's just for kids. You know, I've been studying Buddhism for too long. I mean, I, I don't need to know that kind of stuff. But it, it's <clears throat> what you really need um, is this the humility of being the new student um, every day, um, never being an expert. And um, my, my students who have come with me from Thailand will often hear me uh, relating an anecdote about uh, Albert Einstein. And um, towards the end of his life, um, greatest scientist on the planet, most famous scientist on the planet, um, most immediately recognizable um, scientists on the planet with the long hair and the moustache and everything, you know. And he went to some um, seminar and um, behind stage somebody asked him, who are you? And he said very simply, um, I'm a student of physics. And I th that's just such a, a wonderful response to me that um, Instead of saying, don't you know who I am, or at least um, wanting to say that, you know, you, I've got Nobel, two Nobel Prizes, or however, I'm the most famous scientist in the world, you know, I've forgotten more about physics yesterday than you'll ever learn in your whole life. And um, he said, I'm a, I'm a student of physics. And this is... The, the attitude that um, I would suggest would stand you well in, in Dhamma practice. Never be a Dhamma expert. Um, don't go to the other extent and say, oh, I'm so stupid, I don't understand anything, because that's, that's a form of pride as well. Um, so there are different kinds of pride and conceit. You know, some people are proud and being special and being 
very good at everything. Other people are proud at being hopeless, and it's a very perverse kind of pride. When I, I mean, I don't know in in Malaysia. When I was at school, if you're a boy, you have to be top or you have to be bottom. You know, the worst thing you can be as a, as a boy is in the middle of the class. It's kind of, you know, you've either got to be outrageously good or or really terrible and notorious. You know, there's no no middle ground. So these are kinds of um, conceit uh, that can arise. So we're interested in this very basic um, challenge of abandoning the unwholesome and developing the wholesome. And in one of his teachings to the Sangha, um, the Lord um, Buddha said that the a monk in the, uh, in the noble lineage of the Sangha is a monk who who derives great joy from abandoning the unwholesome and developing the wholesome. And um, this is a teaching which um, gives us a very good reminder that there is, um, I would call it a hierarchy of happiness. And that there are certain, um, there are different levels of happiness and some are compatible and some are and some are not and for the beginner and someone who's just starting out on spiritual life it seems oh you've got to give this up and you've got to give that up and all these things that give me so much pleasure I can't do these anymore and and you can feel it, this kind of shrinking and this kind of fear and it all seems so kind of black and uninviting but the uh, the actual experience, if you take the plunge through that informed faith that uh, I mentioned just now that you can do it and you should do it and you must do it, that nothing else is worth doing, um, then you find that just as certain kinds of pleasure and happiness that you once cherished um, slip away, other forms of happiness take their place um, because as human beings we can't live without happiness and the the secret um, of a long monastic life I would say you know if there's if there's any one secret well there are probably you know a few key points but one is you have to enjoy it you have to really uh, be happy as a monk um, and the monks who stay a long time you know the monks are really happy to be monks if they're just sort of gritting their teeth and fighting defilements and just saying oh it's all suffering you, you, can't, you can't do that for very long really um, but the the kinds of happiness become more refined and as I say, you, you can start to develop a real sense of joy when you see um, defilements and things falling away. And you can experience real joy when you start to see beautiful qualities, spiritual qualities that weren't there before suddenly, suddenly appearing. And, and here... Um, there's another trap that you can fall into. You can start to feel, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be, take any joy in the good qualities I have. I'll get really stuck up and, and proud and conceited. Um, but it, those, that doesn't follow. And in fact, the, the Buddha was constantly teaching us to be intelligent and clever in ways of um, bringing up positive emotion. In the, in the heart as a fuel um, to enable a practice which is consistent um, not just for the few days um, on a meditation retreat uh, but throughout months and years and the ability to recognize the goodness and the noble qualities that are starting to flourish in your heart not as your possession but just as beautiful parts of nature that are starting to appear within your body and mind, then this is something that uh, gives the mind a great buoyancy. Now I use that word um, buoyancy um, 
deliberately and I, I feel it's a good translation of a very key uh, Pali term which is Pamoja. Now in, in his teaching sometimes the Buddha would give these long strings of connected Dhammas and in many um, of these um, strings um, of Dhammas they, you'll notice that they start off in at different points and then at a certain, on a certain level they, they converge and in all those teachings which lead on to um, samadhi and to wisdom and to transcendence and freedom from dukkha in other words in, in the systematic and concerted effort to develop and cultivate good karma the um, convergence point is this pomoja or um, well-being or buoyancy all meditation techniques they have to converge there so whatever technique you're using it has to get to this point of well-being and from well-being um, the next stage is as that well-being matures um, becomes stronger it develops into bhiti or rapture rapture develops into sukha or happiness sukha leads to samadhi samadhi leads to the yatha putanyana dasana seeing things as they are which leads to a sense of revulsion or disenchantment with attachment and defilement um, and leads to letting go and to ultimately to liberation so this progression um, is, is interesting and worthy of, of a lot of attention on many levels um, firstly as I said this, this point that you have to uh, reach that sense of well-being and buoyancy um, and secondly that, that um, the immediate conditioning factor for the samadhi which leads to wisdom and vipassana on the level of abandoning defilements is sukha so we, I may perhaps call this central paradox of Buddha Dhamma that only the happy mind can understand suffering and, and this is um, perhaps the most important um, rationale for the development of samatha and for the emphasis on developing wholesome dhammas in daily life that without the happiness and that sen intense sense of well-being mm, then the mind is not strong enough um, to look into the chasm or over the cliff edge um, of the three characteristics for very long you know you can maybe get to a point and you just um, suddenly you find yourself 10-15 yards away from the cliff edge um, what, what happened you know so there's so much fear and deep-rooted non-conceptual instinctual attachment which um, doesn't answer to reason and logic and analysis um, but has to be um, treated with this fortification of positive emotion um, and this is all the, the um, this is where we see the importance of giving, sharing, generosity helping others, um, keeping precepts all these things um, are working together um, to create this sense of safety and self-respect um, and stability mm. which allows you to open and, and let go mm. so <clears throat> um, are the jhanas are they dukkha you see well yes but how if the jhanas are uh, these incredibly blissful states with 
bitti and sukha and all these uh, all these qualities how could they be dukkha how could they be suffering well on one or two occasions the buddha said they're like a glimpse of what nibbana might be but at the same time that you know they're not nibbana and they don't necessarily lead um, to nibbana um, because they're still in the conditioned world mm. they're not the unconditioned mm. so it's the unconditioned which is the nibbana element and which is the true and ultimate happiness So when we uh, we we're, we're living in the world and we're beginning to see we need uh we need to be experiencing some level of happiness and if we're not pursuing the wholesome forms of happiness gladly and willingly then we'll be pursuing unwholesome forms or if we're pursuing wholesome forms of happiness but we're not totally committed and we just think it's kind of good for us then every now and again the mind will jump out and sort of want a holiday and and so this is a common feature of uh many people's spiritual life that they uh they start to look on meditation and practice as kind of work and we have this kind of work play uh dichotomy in our minds so we've done a lot of work so therefore uh we deserve some play and put a lot of work into a retreat and then after a retreat you de- you deserve a rest you put in a lot of good work there and we we have to um see the fallacy in in that way of looking at our life and notice that um we're always looking at our experience looking at ourselves looking at the dhamma through certain frames frames of reference frames of understanding and we have to make those frames conscious um and we can um easily fall into traps if we're not aware of the the fact that what we're seeing is not pure experience it's always through a lens through a frame and um the experiences we have in spiritual life are are, are very uh, clear examples of this now the way that my teacher um taught the four noble truths was not uh, one where he would give a great deal of intellectual analysis although every now and again he would give um explanatory discourses but his um favorite uh, way of teaching would be to frustrate his disciples so um not to give you something that you want and then see what happens so you can only do that if you're very um confident in your um uh, in yourself as a teacher and um it's it's a kind of t- uh, teaching also which is only really possible when uh most of the or all of the disciples believe that teacher is enlightened if you're not enlightened or if you are and nobody believes you are it can be a disastrous way of teaching luckily ajahn char he did have that kind of um uh parami and was able to do that um, so you be um waiting for uh, i'll give you an example i mean just a very simple example uh we we eat one meal a day in the forest monasteries get up um 3 o'clock in the morning morning chanting meditation 5 o'clock sometimes walking um 3 4 5 kilometers sometimes more come back with a bowl full of sticky rice very heavy um haven't eaten for 24 hours um some days you've you've worked uh, some um maybe 5 6 hours of hard physical work so you can probably manage imagine by the time your daily meal comes around you're pretty hungry um and the the t- the um, practice was that after arms round there would be a period of something like half an hour or 45 minutes even an hour um before the meal is offered and we would sit in the dining hall we were um we were asked to meditate 
and it's very difficult um, to meditate in those kinds of things. You feel very hungry and, and you'll be very sensitive to the clock and sounds of people coming. And, and um, Ajahn Chah would have uh, always a number of guests who would um, be coming to offer the food. And um, after all the food had been distributed, um, which was a cause of, of a great dukkha in itself, in that you had no control about what you ate. Every, all the monks had to get up off their seats and take a big um, pot of curry or whatever and walk down the line and just slop it into people's bowls. And so you couldn't um, say, I don't want this, I don't want that. You just got whatever was in your bowl and you sat down again. Um, so that was already uh, one teaching. But then you sit down afterwards and Ajahn Chah would um, speak with the lay people, say a few words, and then his signal that, it was, um, that the conversation was over was he'd clear his throat. <clears throat> and then he'd give the blessing. And so I can remember a number of occasions, you know, we'd be sitting there and, and he, would, he would be speaking with lay people and then suddenly go, <clears throat> and then all the monks would just supposedly meditate. And they would all, immediately, you know, everybody's, you know, raring to go, really. And, um, and then some days he would then start to talk again. And it was a, and you put your hands down again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a few more minutes and go, <coughs> and it's to start talking again. Um, so this was a way that he would integrate these actually very important teachings into just the everyday um, details, you know, of our life as monks, rather than and giving a, a very detailed sort of abhidhamma analysis of the relationship between the different noble truths. Um, he said, what's happening here? I'm suffering. What's, why am I suffering? Is Ajahn Chah making me suffer? Well, no, not really. I'm suffering because I'm hungry. I want to eat and I can't eat until he gives the... I want something. I'm not getting it and I don't like it, you see. Um, and these are the kinds of teachings that you'd be getting again and again as a, as a young monk, seeing how Suffering arising because of tanha, of craving. Mm. It's not something that anybody's doing to you. Um, the immediate trigger for suffering may lie outside of yourself. But the, the true cause is uh, coming from within. Um, so you're, you're, you're put on the spot. You have to find ways of dealing with that. Mm. And, and often it's just a way, of, uh, the, for me, the most effective way of just changing the frame, having that mindfulness to recognize what's going on and then reframing it all. I'm just saying, well, um, whenever, uh, whenever uh, Ajahn Chah, whenever Lung Po is ready, um, that's fine with me. Um, it's only 8 o'clock in the morning. We don't have to eat till 12. We've got another four hours. Um, I can, I can wait. I could, I could just. Uh, I'm not going to suffer about this. I'm just going to um, be patient. So sometimes having, having these ideals and through, um, uh, it can be very useful, um, because um, as a monk, the you know the virtue that's being drummed into you again and again and again and again is to be patient to learn how to endure, to be patient with, to peacefully coexist with the unpleasant. And so, yeah, I can endure this, it's not so bad. And I'm developing patience. I'm developing uh, one of the most important virtues just by sitting here um, and waiting and not getting agitated. Um, so seeing it as a Dhamma practice rather than uh, just following the uh, the craving and the desire, just a switch, like a um, a recognition of what's going on. The the actual situation's not changed, but by by being able to bring up that mindfulness, re-establish attention, and then through the use of wise reflection, um, looking again, interpreting the situation in. Um, a new way, and the bad karma which you're creating through the frustration and and the uh, and the, the thoughts of aversion 
is just turned on its head and good karma can take its place. So what's um, becoming, uh, what was becoming, you know, a cauldron of dukkha um, can turn into path of, of sukha. So um, when we have um, these, uh, these goals of freedom from greed, hatred and delusion and seeing that the, the small happinesses and pleasures of daily life um, are not absolutely necessary to us, that there are other um, there are there are other kinds of happiness that we can access very easily um, if we establish our mindfulness well. This gives us a great deal of confidence in our spiritual life. So Ajahn Chah would be pointing out to us again, again. He said that there there are certain kinds of happiness um, that lead to um, more happiness and certain kinds of happiness that lead to suffering, certain kinds of suffering that lead to more suffering, and certain kinds of happiness that lead, suffering that leads to happiness. So if we're just um, reacting to situations and following the pleasant and avoiding the unpleasant as an unconscious kind of strategy for getting through life, um, the dukkha that we experience is never going to diminish. Um, but when we have that ability to stop and calmly look at what's happening and evaluate what's happening in terms of the growth or decline of greed, hatred and delusion, the growth and decline of generosity, compassion and wisdom, we, have, uh, we, we are plugged into the middle path. We, we have a clear understanding of, of how to proceed. The actual details and the, and the particular practices, the particular reflections, <coughs> will, will depend a great deal on, on the situation and, and your own level of, of wisdom and, and experience. But um, we can just turn things over so easily um, with the, that power of uh, mindfulness, wise reflection, and ability to calm the mind, to um, to develop the, these um, practices, we need to be applying ourselves to it all the time. So, you know, what, what kind of Dhamma practice can you do in a meeting uh, when there's a lot going on? You know, you, you can't just um, sit there and watch your breath. You can do, you probably get the sack or, um, you know, you're, you're expected to contribute and to speak to listen. Um, so if your idea of Dhamma practice is uh, watching a rising and falling or sensations in your body, you're, you're, going, to be, you're going to be stuck there. So although uh, mindfulness um, is a constant and is needed in every situation, the, the object of mindfulness um, needs to be varied according to circumstance. So if, we, if you're uh, alone, and um, you don't have any kind of time constraints, you can just uh, be, develop um, uh, some awareness of the, uh, the body, the physical movement. If you're in a um, social situation or in a meeting, uh, when people are talking, um, you can develop uh, mindfulness of the emotions that arise. Somebody praises you, somebody blames you, somebody says something you think is stupid, somebody's uh, says something you think is, is wonderful, noticing what's, what's arising. When you have to speak, do you feel self-conscious? Um, are you uh, anxious about people's reaction? Are you paranoid? Are you, uh, how do you respond to praise? How do you respond to criticism? These, these are all um, things that we have to be developing mindfulness um, and awareness of. And this is how we're developing the, the good karma and abandoning uh, the bad karma in, in our daily life. So when you see the, um, uh, the importance of, of, of karma and good karma and bad karma, and not just dismissing it as kind of ABC, basic um, 
uh, nursery school, kindergarten, Buddhism, but it, it's absolutely essential to every level. And, and taking on that teaching of Kama and reflecting on it again and again uh, can have quite revolutionary effect on your, on your life. Certainly you see, I just don't have time, you know, to uh, get angry over just something like that. I mean, life's too short. I don't, uh, and every time I get angry, it's increasing that anger rut in my mind and taking me, you know, further away from, um, from Nibbana, further away from peace, further away from true happiness. Um, every single action, every single volitional movement of my mind and uh, word I say thing is, has an effect. Um, it's, nobody, it's not a uh, system of reward and punishment, it's just a natural phenomenon. Um, the more, uh, let, let, let's take a, an example, you, you're, you're working with somebody uh, who is annoying or you find annoying and you, you try to be patient and um, you have a real strong urge as soon as that person walks out of the room uh, to criticize him or her to your best friend, isn't he obnoxious, isn't she this, isn't she that? Um, and uh, you're able to restrain that urge, but then one day it's just too much. Finally, your patience snaps. The person walks out of the room and you start to run them down. And then that person says, yeah, and... And that's even worse when they have the same kind of aversion because there's nothing like two friends for feeding unwholesome dhammas. Um, when, and both when you both think you're right and they're wrong. Uh, so beware that feeling I'm right as well because that's a really dangerous feeling. So um, you, you let it all out and uh, you feel quite good about that. But notice that if the, that same thing happens again the next day, um, it's that much easier and that much more likely that you will um, criticize and gossip about that person behind their back. And the third time, the fourth time becomes easier and easier. And so something which uh, really went against the grain and something that you really had a sense of shame and, and, and uh, a strong sense, I should restrain myself um, here, um, in a matter of uh, a few days, has completely disappeared. Mm. So, in mathematics, we know like, like if you're making a jump from zero to one, one to two, two to three, you know, it's an equal gap. But psychologically, the gap from zero to one is huge. But the gap from one to two um, is not very wide at all. And the gap from two to three to three to four is almost indistinguishable. And this is how habits and bad habits arise, just little by little, little by little, um, and suddenly um, we're, we have this idea of who we are, and then we, we, suddenly we, f we find people have a very different idea of who we are. Have you ever had somebody says, well, you're that kind of person? And they say, no, I'm not. You know, I'm not like that at all. Um, and, and then they, and you think, well, why do they think we're like that? And you realize that they're judging you on your actions and speech. Well, you're judging yourself on who you think you are or who you'd like to be or who you think you should be and who you were some time ago. So you say, well, you know, have you, um, have you noticed um, now when people are, uh, particularly in America, they're arrested um, uh, for some terrible crime and they'll say, well, this isn't really me. This isn't the real me who's doing this. You know? So there's this idea, there's this real me who's very virtuous. And, and, and this person who does and says nasty things is it's not really me. You know? That's kind of some kind of false um, uh, surrogate self. But in the law of kamma, uh, it's what you do, what you say, not, uh, not your idea about yourself. Uh, which counts, and every single moment of the day you, you have that choice, you know, to, to go the, the path, the middle way, 
uh, or to follow greed, hatred and delusion. And, and that's why our lives have so much meaning and significance, you know. Um, and see that uh, the meaning of our life is not something to be measured by income, by how big a house you have, how big a car you've got, um, how big a bank account and, and so on, how famous you are. It, what's, what's in the balance is uh, what you've done, what you've said, um, what you've thought about, what you've dwelt upon, what you've taken pleasure in, what you've enjoyed. This, this is uh, the karmic um, result of, of every day of our life. So even if you're, um, you're retired, you're no longer working, you're no longer making money, and in a modern capitalist society you're somehow considered to be not you know, a fully functioning uh, member of society if you're not making money these days. But you, if you're making good karma, then you say you're an extremely productive member of society. Mm. So the path and the, the goal can seem very far away, um, uh, but the, the action, you know, small action, moment by moment, what are you thinking about, what are you taking interest in, what are you delighting in, what are you doing, what are you saying, these are basic practices but they're also, in the long term, the most profound. So we know, yeah, I'm a, I'm a meditator, I really think meditation is a good thing, and then so on and so forth. And say, well, uh, do you meditate every day? Well, well almost. You know? <laughs> um, and, well, how long? Well, I, lo I used to, yeah, I know, but today, in, uh, not talking about yesterday or a month ago, or you know, um, how long you used to, um, what are you doing right now? This, this is, this is karma. Mm. So seeing, uh, looking closely, really closely at happiness and suffering, pleasure and pain in daily life. This is the grounding in everyday experience um, which um, really sustains this, this path of practice and the abandonment of the wholesome development of the whole thing. It's something we can all do. You know, there, there's, there's nothing here which is beyond any of you. You say, oh, I can't do that. And I say, well, can you try to do that? Yeah, who is there here who can't try to do something? Mm. And that's the good karma, the trying. Yeah, you can be successful, uh, very successful, sometimes not so successful. But it's, it's the effort, the sincerity, the trying to do something and being proud of that, you know, taking joy in the fact I'm someone who tries. I, yeah, sometimes I get angry, sometimes I get jealous, sometimes I say stupid things, but I'm trying to reduce um, the amount of greed, hatred and delusion in my life. I'm trying to increase and to cultivate the qualities of generosity and inner peace and, and loving kindness and all those virtues and, and most especially wisdom. Learning to use wisdom more and more rather than just following um, desire. So as long as you see this is really wonderful, I've got to have this, I can't, if I don't have this I won't have anything else. And you see, and then you're already setting yourself up for dukkha. Um, because if you, if you say no, this wonderful, a really enjoyable experience, I'm not going to do I'm a Buddhist practitioner, I'm going to say no, just say no, no, okay. But then you say, oh, it's a, now I've said no with this and I should say at least yes to that, I mean, just to make up for it. And then you say no, 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 and then sometimes you go, yes, you know. And your yes is, you know, makes up for all the no's. And, um, so what's the problem? You know, how do you how do you go beyond that? Instead of saying, oh, I'm hopeless. I try to do it. I can't do it. Other people can do it, but I just all this bad karma from past lives. I don't know. Um, but stop. Just be. Just re-examine what's happening. What what is the basic cause here? The basic cause is you're giving a value to that. Your 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 initial mistake is saying. This is so wonderful, this is so great, this is so important, this is so, so enjoyable. And so if you have this feeling that I'm not enjoying something I really enjoy, 
you're setting up an inner conflict and usually you know, you're going to succumb and then feel guilty and terrible afterwards. But the, the movement of wisdom, which is facilitated by the mindfulness that just stops that kind of initial reaction and going into that rut, and you're saying, is it really so wonderful? Is it really going to give me what I want? What is it I really want? Hmm. So my, my belief is that deep, deep in our hearts, what we really, really want is Nibbāna. We want true, unconditioned happiness, freedom from suffering. Um, and our mistake is that we're rushing around um, seeking for happiness in sex and power and money and all these kind of things. Um, and all that kind of uh, crazy uh, and uh, futile uh, kind of running around and running around in circles is a repression of the fundamental desire for Nibbana. So um, I would say Sigmund Freud, like so many of the great Western thinkers, got things you know, completely upside down. You know, for him, um, religious impulses and everything were all a repression of the sexual instinct. So I'm saying it's the other way around. That this weird uh, kind of mad desire for, for sex and enjoyment and everything is a repression of the fundamental deep-seated desire and need for Nibbana. So we say, well, is this really going to give me what, what I want? Um, have we ever had it before? Did it do it for me? Uh, how happy was I? How, for how long was I happy? You know? And what happened after it wore off? And then I needed more. And then you have this, the law of diminishing returns. This much can give you a certain amount of pleasure. After a while you have to increase the amount, increase the amount, increase the amount. Is there really any end to it? Is there any real satisfaction to it? So using um, the mind which can calm the, the, the whirlwind of desire and all this madness of thinking and calming the mind, stilling the mind and then really looking at the objects of desire um, and seeing that as long as there is this craving here then uh, we'll never truly be satisfied. Is that true? You know, it's not that we have to believe that because the Buddha said, but it's like this is the working hypothesis we have, that following this craving is never going to give us what we truly want, but letting go of that craving will. Um, is that true? Does that ring true with our experience? Um, so this is path of abandonment of unwholesome dhammas, because clearly seeing the unsatisfactory nature of them, uh, cultivating wholesome dhammas of body, speech and mind, cultivating wholesome kamma, by seeing the beauty, the nobility of it and the fact that good and wholesome kamma leads to the ultimate. You can't just jump from the unwholesome to the, to the ultimate. You have to go from unwholesome to wholesome to ultimate. You know, that, that's the law of nature. So um, I think I've spoken longer than I was invited to, so I apologize if you're um, writhing around on the floor. And I'd like to end the talk at this point. Thank you. <laughs>